as I think all of you know that <coughs> I'm not very well. I'm under the weather. My throat is sore and I cannot look at screen for quite a long time. And I was stuck in the traffic while coming here because the class had to start somehow because you guys are waiting. And from tomorrow we are starting with the crash course that is there. And uh, they are not very fine. I'll, I'll, I, have, I have also called Anand sir for the same because I was stuck Gurgaon at this time. It's Monday rush. So he is also on the way. Probably I will take something up and then he will continue. So, but from tomorrow there will be regular crash course. This is the last session of pre-crash course which was supposed to be taken uh, on Saturday, last Saturday. So I'll just I'll just uh, tell you what all things we'll be discussing or covering up today. <coughs> the most uh, very important, not the most important, but very important part of RC is tones. Now, what are tones? So it, it's it's very uh, simple to understand tones. For example, right right now, the way I'm talking to you. What kind of tone is it? It looks like a narrative tone. I'm narrating something, uh, kind of a story from my own um, condition right now. That's a narrative tone. I can be angry at times. So there can be, basically there can be three, three types of tones. <coughs> one will be negative, one will be neutral, and then we'll be having the positive tone. Negative is like angry, sarcastic, uh, neutral is like critical, analytical, technical. In positive tone, we can have humorous tone or motivating tone. So all those tones are positive. Now, there's one one more thing which um, is there <coughs> that in the last ten years, in the last ten years of RC, I have seen the papers and I have in the last ten years I have written CAT four times and. It never happened, even in one, one instance, that there was any kind of question which was directly given on tone. And that's a surprise. So in the last 10 years, it has never happened. Okay. Then why, why do we do it? <coughs> the thing is, it's when, when, for example, when we start quantitative aptitude, so the first session that I take is of Vedic mathematics, or you can say calculations. Okay. So in those, uh, it happens that calculations, we have calculator on in cat Calcul calculation if you're not good at calculation it would not uh, be kind of you know it won't hamper it won't hamper your score but when i take the class i tell you that somehow indirectly it develops your uh, mathematical acumen it develops it, it saves a lot of time in the same way this rc tones it basically sets sets up sets up the feeling sets up the tone actually sets a tone for the entire reading comprehension so uh, that is that is uh, why having a fair idea about tones is very 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 necessary because once you read the passage there will be certain things which you can answer in with, with the it will be an indirect benefit from the tones for example <coughs> the questions of main idea main idea of the passage central idea or even the supporting ideas so sometimes sometimes it happens that a passage is totally neutral, but in between, uh, like there's a passage, there's a paragraph in which there is something which is very critical. So that can be, that can give you a fair idea about the supporting, uh, supporting uh, idea of the passage, the entire, entire passage. These are the indirect questions which are, which are somehow dependent on tones. Moreover, once you get the tone, it will be very easy for you to understand the passage and also be in the sync with what author is saying. So that is that is why um, I would say having an idea about tones is very necessary. <coughs> At the same time, we have also uh, planned a few classes in which we'll be discussing the vocabulary. Now you will say vocabulary. If you don't have a good vocabulary, would you be able to crack that? Of course you can. But there are <coughs> in the, the passages. There'll be four passages in which there'll be different genres, and there can be history. It can be psychology, business economics. So there are. There are there are some instances like you you can be from engineering background, and after that um, you uh, 
and there's a passage on business and, business and economics and you don't have any idea about it because you probably have not read about business and economics news in your life. That is why there's certain, certain words which are very common. I have made a list of around 500 words. I'll be, I'll be discussing some of them in the classes and then I'll give you the entire PDF of it so that you go through it. I'll be discussing the most common words and through one word we can, we can actually crack five to six different words. That is how I have made the list. Um, for business economics, for psychology, for history. By the way, the most common genre in uh, CAT is history. Like I have seen two passages, almost two passages are directly or indirectly on history. It can be society or politics in historical perspective. So history is very important. So we'll be discussing some terms from, from sociology, from history and from anthropology as well. So that will be important. These are the <coughs> foundation classes which will be helpful for you. And um, apart from that, there is a new thing which has come in care last year and that is called para-completion. Or you can say fill in the blanks. So for para-completion, I am creating a few questions which I will be uh, sharing on the assignments dashboard because you don't have it right now. Somebody, uh, some student asked me about that. So we will be doing that, <coughs> so para-completion. And we will be having a, a total, a, a full dedicated session on, on para-completion. Now, for para-completion, there are various things necessary. One is vocabulary. And when I say vocabulary, basically it's not vocabulary, it's contextual vocabulary. So when you say contextual vocabulary, it means that if you look at a word and you know the context, so even if you don't know the exact meaning of it, you will actually get the context. Uh, actually, you'll actually get the, <coughs> the, the, the uh, you would say, a fair idea of, of that particular word, how it is used, in what context it is used. This is very important, and this will be helpful for you in para-completion. In para-completion, there's one more thing, which is called grammar. So we'll be having a session on grammar also, in which we'll be discussing the parts of speech and how the prepositions, conjunctions, etc., are used while framing sentences, because that is how you can actually complete the paragraphs. So this is all about the crash course that we are going to start. But today, we'll be doing tones. And I can just see Anand sir has come. And <coughs> probably you are getting a feeling that my voice is very low. If I, if I try to modulate it, I'll start coughing. So I don't want that. Uh, I'm on pills right now. So I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be meeting you tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll be starting with geometry. That'll be the first session. And I would invite Anand sir to take ahead uh, <coughs> the class on tones. So I'm welcoming him. And let's 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 catch up tomorrow. Uh, no, there's no need to read about Indian history. Do not read anything. Just be just be with me. Be trust the process, the process that we are go going to do for the next uh, two and a half months. And this is be this will be sufficient and enough for you to crack cat with flying colors. Thank you. Hello, good evening everyone. So, as you see that uh, somehow some strange kind of virus has gotten into the premises of iQuanta and uh, most of the faculties are suffering from it and uh, we have got a strange kind of like a viral fever, all of us. So, but uh, uh, Abhishek's health uh, deteriorated just today, so he could not continue the session. So, it was arranged in such a way that he will come for the introduction part and then I will continue with the session. So, we are going to discuss these uh, tones in detail and uh, we will be learning some very important tones and apart from that we will be practicing some questions based on tones. So, let us start the session with a very simple question that uh, What do you do when you want to say something? So, so when, when you are trying to say something, when you want to say something, what do you do? What is the first thing that you do? Yeah, so life moment and toxic hers and uh, Muhammad Atif. So, a lot of you, a lot of you have given the perfect answer. 
the correct answer. So this is what we do actually. When we want to say something, we actually say it. Nothing else but we say it. So we, we want to say something and we say it. That's what we do. And that's exactly what these authors do. So here in the passage, the author is actually talking to you. The author is trying to communicate with his reader through these sentences. So he has got something on his mind. He is simply trying to convey his feelings, his emotions or something that he is thinking of. He is trying to say it out to his readers. So, but the next question is, uh, why are you saying it in the first place? So that's good that you say it. Yes, you say it. But why are you saying it? Why do you say it? So because you are feeling in a certain kind of way, in a particular way. So you just want to convey that emotion. So one question is, why are you saying it in the first place? And the second is, with what emotions or feelings do you say this? So answer to this question will answer this purpose. So authors talk and they talk because they have got a purpose, purpose of writing. So once you understand why the author is saying all these things, he is talking about some particular matter, he is talking about history, he is talking about philosophy, he is talking about Marx, he is talking about Kant, he is talking about Aristotle or he is talking about some particular way of society. He is making a commentary on some particular institution. But why? What is he trying to say ultimately? So you need to understand his purpose behind writing that article, behind writing that purpose. And why it happens most of the time that you keep reading the passage but the words don't make any sense to you. You, you must have felt it that when you are halfway through the passage, you feel lost. You are disconnected with the passage. Why, is, why does it happen most of the times? It happens because while reading the first few sentences of the passage, you fail to capture the purpose of the author. You fail to understand the subject matter which is being discussed. Suppose, uh, let's take a very common example of education, condition of education in India. And the author starts the first sentence by saying, the government in the last decade could have done a lot than what it did for the condition of education in India. Then he give, comes up with certain figures and numbers, some facts and data. So, so and uh, you get read, you start reading it, but you don't understand uh, the subject matter or you don't get the tone of the author. And that's why by the time you reach to the second paragraph, you are lost. And once you, it's like, uh, it's like jumping on a, I like a running horse. The horse is running, you have to tame it, you have to ride it. So if you fail in understanding the purpose of writing in the first paragraph, it is very likely that you will be lost in your reading. But once you get the content of the passage by reading one or two sentences that or the discussion is going in this particular direction you get the direction of the discussion, then you won't lose your track in the second or third paragraph. So it is very important to understand the subject matter or the purpose of the passage in, and try to do this in the first few sentences, one, two, three sentences, max to max first paragraph. By that time you should be able to understand what is being discussed and with what emotions and feelings, this is also very important, an answer to this question is your tone. Once you understand, so that this subject is being discussed, suppose the condition of education in India is being discussed, this is the subject. Now there are only three possible ways of discussing that subject matter. Either the author will be very happy with the, with the condition of education in India, he will be very happy, he will be satisfied, he will be okay. So his tone will be positive. So he has got a positive attitude towards the subject matter that he is discussing. Or he might not be very happy with the condition of education in India. In that case, his tone is going to be negative. 
he is not happy with the subject matter it could be any subject matter education i am taking only for an example it could be discussing about some move of the government some recent development on the global uh, platform or any forum some recent summit that was held in a particular country what could be the outcome what were the uh, topics that were discussed it, it can be any subject matter majorly you will either be happy with the thing that you are discussing or you will not be happy with the thing that you are discussing there is third possible tone which is neutral so he is neither happy nor sad nor very dejected he is simply talking in terms of facts and data so this kind of tone is neutral basically so if you are like uh, laudatory towards the uh, moves of the government towards the initiatives taken by the government and how the government has tried to be very inclusive and uh, bring up uh, new policies that are good for the education in india then you are positive you are not satisfied with the government's effort and you think that government could have done much more then you are your attitude is critical and you are not happy with whatever is happening and you another way of talking about the same thing could be a neutral way like you are presenting data that in 2005 number of graduates was this much by 2015 the total number of graduates moved to this much now you are not including your opinion you are not saying anywhere whether it is very good thing or it is a bad thing you are simply presenting the data and it is up to the reader to decide whether it's a good thing or a bad thing so when you are neutral you basically deals you deal with facts and data so majorly these three tones are possible positive neutral and negative now let's classify these tones further so we are going to learn some tones and that questions based on tone as abhishek sir told you uh, don't come very frequently in cat but still understanding this question is very important understanding tone is very important because then you will be able to answer questions of main idea and supporting idea argumentative could be positive as well as negative we will see that so let's uh, discuss these negative tones first so the examples could be acerbic harsh severe bitter caustic or vitriolic all these words are synonymous almost synonymous they all represent same kind of tone and they all represent a very negative tone so you see that it could also be a question of vocabulary if you understand this word acerbic if you understand this word vitriolic only then you will know whether the tone is acerbic or vitriolic or not so what these words are we just need to understand that we just need to understand their meaning and once you understand the meaning of these words only then you will understand that this is the tone so here uh, the author is going to be severely critical so he'll be critical about the subject matter with whatever the subject is being discussed the author will be very critical severely critical about it and he'll openly express his resentment that he is not happy critical itself in itself it's a tone but if you just notice that the degree of criticism is very severe and he is not shying off from like using very harsh word for the policy or for the government or for any kind of institution then you can say that the author is actually being acerbic and uh, acerbic is like the word which we use in acid so acerbic is bitterness extreme bitterness in your way of communication in the in it and it will show in your choice of words you will be choosing very harsh words to criticize someone and you will be in that condition acerbic severe bitter or vitriolic so the tone is critical but severe criticism plus open use of harsh word will indicate towards these tones angry and indignant both are all again synonymous and this is also a negative tone angry or indignant and then 
you might wonder how to identify whether the author is being acerbic or he is being angry. So, for that you need to develop this uh, capability in yourself that when you talk to someone, when you talk to your friend, you talk to you, your colleague, you talk to your family member, you always know what their mood is. You always know when your father is angry and when he is happy. How do you know that? Because you are very keen in observing his uh, body language, his facial expression. Plus your supportive element, the supporting element in that case is also the words that are being used by your father. So, when your father uses uh, very, I mean happy words, you know that he is happy and when he uses angry words, you know he is angry. So, that is how you understand the tone of the author. So, you need to try to hear his voice. So, try to hear the voice of the author and you will feel the difference in anger and uh, acerbicity. So, acerbicity is severe criticism where you are using very harsh words, but it will not so an impact your, 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 you could be critical because you are not happy because this movement or this move by the government is not good for the society. But when you are angry, your inclusion of personal emotion increases a little bit and uh, they are very close, both the tones are very close, but anger and uh, criticism are two different things and you will understand this once you can hear the author talking. Then belligerent or bellicose, both are synonymous again. Some people have this tendency of fighting with the air, so they are like very quarrelsome. They are very quarrelsome, they are ready to fight even with the air. These kind of people are called belligerent or bellicose. So, you will notice that the voice of the author is actually being very loud. So, you are reading words, you are reading words, you are not listening to these words. So, when you listen someone talking, when you hear them, you, you, you know that they are being loud, but you need to reach to that level when you can see that these words have been shouted on the paper, they are not written. These words are not written on the paper, they have been shouted on the paper. The author is being very loud, he is being very quarrelsome. That kind of style of talking or writing is called belligerent or bellicose. And in that case, the author is going to be very loud, he will be shrieking and you might see this symbol like this punctuation a lot of times. In that kind of writing, you will be finding this a lot. Plus, you can find these things written under quotations like this, followed by this mark, exclamatory mark. So, they, these things are said often out very out loud. So, this will one, this could be one indicator towards this kind of tone. Then condescending and patronizing, element of superiority. So, you will notice an element of superiority in his voice. So, you know some people always try to prove that somehow they are superior to others, somehow they know more than others, somehow they are better than others. So, how will you know this? So, when they talk you just understand what they are trying to say. They will be using words like this, they will be saying things like this, they will take every chance, they won't miss any chance to prove that they are better than you. This kind of writing is called condescending or patronizing. So, they are somehow trying to say that they are better than others or that particular institution is better than others, their understanding is better than others. This kind of writing is superiority and you can find this element when the author is being acerbic or angry. So, he is being unnecessarily acerbic, he is being unnecessarily angry. The situation is not that worse, but still he is trying to show that oh, this could have been done better had it been a person like me or some intelligent fellow, he could have done this better than they did. Now, a comparison is being made and by that comparison you are trying to prove 
that one party is better than the other party. This kind of writing will show the element of superiority and you are being condescending or you are patronizing. So, that is the tone of the author in this case. And then you can be contemptuous, derisive or disparaging. Again these three words are synonymous. So, whether you are contemptuous, derisive or disparaging, you are being the same thing. And this is again very negative, you are being critical and here again you will be criticizing the other party with an element of superiority. And just these two are very close in the same way this condescending and contemptuous are actually very close. So, you are like being scornful and you just express your hatred, you are so critical that you are not afraid of showing your hatred for something or someone and your hatred is very visible in your writing, you are actually being contemptuous and you will be using words like that, this was not good, this was like pathetic, this was a scornful, I disdain this and expressions like this will be very apparent and in that case your writing has become contemptuous. You have moved one step further from being condescending. So, condescending is already patronizing, condescending is already negative, but when you move one step further, you become contemptuous. So, just like this, these two are very close. Then cynical, this is very important and uh, cynicism is a very beautiful word, you should understand this. So, when you are cynical, what this attitude is? When you believe that no one does anything for anyone for free, you are cynical. So, someone is like doing something good for the society, they are distributing blankets in winters and you just observe this happening, but still you say you know why, is, why he is doing this, because elections are around the corner, that is why he is distributing blankets to the poor. To the poor. So, he is doing a good thing, but you see that he is doing this for his own benefit. This kind of approach is called cynical approach. You are not ready to believe that anyone can do anything good for anyone without any reason. So, there is always some reason behind every good act. There is always some hidden motive or personal agenda behind every good activity this kind of belief is cynicism. So, sometimes the author would say that though the government has taken this initiative for this sector of the society, but they have done this only because elections are around the corner. Now, this sentence itself shows that the writing is very cynical and you can talk like this about anything or anyone. Now, let us discuss some positive tones. Laudatory. Laudatory is like sim you will come and praise whatever is happening, you are simply praising it, you are very happy about it and you are openly expressing your uh, appraisal for this like uh, that is a good thing. So, uh, it is a very good initiative taken by the government. So, just this single sentence that it was a very good initiative taken by the government, this sentence itself is laudatory you call something good, you applaud it. So, you will see that the author is applauding some institution or some situation. Plus, uh, where will you the find these kind of tones? It is also important that not every kind of RC can be laudatory. Suppose, you are talking about uh, history or philosophy or psychology. So, it is very difficult to find this tone there. So, in the history passages, psychology passages, philosophy passages, why would the author applaud anything? But if it is a political passage or a contemporary issue is being discussed, especially of government or any other institution, authority, then obviously, if the tone is positive, it can be laudatory. Now, motivating, this is very easy to recognize, you always know when someone is trying to motivate you. So, when they just say that do not give up, uh, there is like uh, still some hope and one day or the other you will just make it, you will be there, you will get to it. 
So motivational speakers are very easy to identify and they are just always trying to uh, boost your, your morale. So when you read this, you know this. And uh, motivational speakers, uh, a passage written by any motivational speaker or a self-help, an excerpt from self-help book is likely to be written in this tone. Then humanistic and ethical. So, usually the passages on humanity, the passages on the status of uh, indignant or the condition of poor or condition of deprived. So, whenever you discuss the condition of deprived people, whether in present or past, it is very likely that the tone is likely to be humani humanistic or ethical that this should be done, that should not be done, this is better, this is good and that is how we should behave. So, always talking about good conduct, morality and good conduct, that what is ethical, what is moral, these things are being discussed and it is going in positive direction, then the tone is likely to be humanistic or ethical. Humorous is, ha is one more positive tone and this is also very important. So, you are somehow trying to cause amusement, you are trying to muse your readers, the author is trying to muse his readers and he is trying to produce some kind of smile on the face of the reader. So, while reading a text, you kind of, uh, you want to smile or an unnecessary laugh. Uh, spreads across your face, then maybe the tone is humorous, that is why it is happening. And the other words which are very close to humor are uh, like, uh, let me write those also, which are very close to humor are sarcasm and satire. Now, who would tell me the difference between sarcasm and satire? What is the difference between sarcasm and satire? See, Tayal, if humor is condescending, then the tone is condescending, it is not humorous. If the humor is mocking, then the tone is mocking. But if the humor is like uh, not in the bad light, only then you go for the humorous tone. Now, satire is not actually very negative, satire is satire, and in that case, you will be get the option like satirical. So, tone could be satirical and uh, so Aman is saying that satire is used to personally attack people under the mask of humor and sarcasm is just plain humor without ill intention. Now, this is very important to understand the difference between these two words. Some people think that they are same or they are very close, but this style is very same, they both could be humorous, but then what is the difference? Sarcasm is always personal, you are attacking someone personally, you are being sarcastic, so you are trying to mock someone, so you are trying to mock an individual, an institution and they have done something wrong and now you are there to laugh and look at them, that is how they are. And satire is majorly social, so it is a social commentary. So, if the commentary is about some social vice, that this is a social vice, for example, casteism in India is a social vice. You discuss casteism and you make fun of casteism or you make fun of every system 
that uh, promotes casticism, then it is a satire because your commentary is social. But when you attack some individual, that would be sarcasm. Now, some of you might have read this book, uh, The White Tiger. Now, if you read this entire book, the book has been written in a very humorous tone. The book is humorous, but when you just move this humor one step further and it becomes a social commentary, then it becomes a satire. So, the white tiger is nothing but a satire on the difference between India and Bharat. So, in this book you will get two kind of Indias in one India. So, one is India of dark and the other is India of light and how those Indias are like very strikingly different. So, that is a social commentary. Sarcasm could be like a, a remark made to mock you by your friend. So, if your friend mocks you that is not a satire that is a sarcasm. Now, introspective is like uh, often you are talking about past, your own past. So, the author is talking about his own past that 20 years ago, 50 years ago when I was in Vietnam, I could have done this, I could have done that. This was the chance that I had, but I just missed it. So, you talk things from the past, you are introspective, you are like uh, and you are uh, uh, like a self analysis, you are doing a self analysis uh, that uh, this could have been better had I chosen this. So, this kind of discussion is introspective and the author would weigh different kind of options that he had. So, had I gone for this life would have been different, had I gone for this life would have been different. So, this kind of writing is called like introspective, yeah introspection is a positive thing. So, your marks in mocks are not increasing and you are uh, constantly stuck at 40 percentile, 60 percentile, then suddenly you need to introspect. Intro is in, intro is inwards and spect is look. So, when you look inwards, you are doing introspection. So, like uh, the other words from spec could be retrospect. So, retro is past and looking backwards at your life, at the events of your life is retrospection. Prospect. So, pro is future. So, pro future, retro past, intro inwards. So, that is how these words have been made. So, doing introspection is a good thing, Atma Avalokan, it is called Atma Avalokan. You look inside, you look in yourself and you try to evaluate your actions, you try to evaluate your position in the world or society. In that case, you are introspective. Grandiose, I have put this in positive and especially you when you talk about like uh, uh, art and culture. So, especially a passage based on art piece could be grandiose. So, when it talks about the grandeur of the palace, grandeur of any sculpture, grandeur of any artwork, uh, it was how massive it was, how giant, it, how big it was. So, and uh, it was so beautiful. So, it, this kind of talk is grandiose and uh, especially when you talk about some art piece, your talk could be like this plus talking big could also be grandiose. So, when you talk big about anything, it could be grandiose. Now, incendiary and provocative I have put in this category here positive. Some of you might question this that is it positive, how can this be positive. So, Hindi mein aap isko bolte hain bhadkana kisi ko. So, jab aap kisi ko bhadka rahe hain, how can you be positive. But I have put this here in this category because uh, most of the speeches given by the leaders, so the political leaders try to provoke their supporters and the speech is likely to be provocative or incendiary or 
yes remember the scene of war so before going to the war the general is trying to provocate his soldiers by saying things like this is the last chance that you have to the glory and just go and claim your glory it's now or never let the enemy know that you are the most fierce force on this planet and things like that you are being actually incendiary or provocative the satire is not a negative tone i won't say that satire is negative plus understanding this like a uh, uh, see satire is a social commentary so he is making fun of something and you might want to put this in negative category but he could have been acerbic he could have been angry he could have been belligerent he could have been condescending he could have been contemptuous but he is being satirical and being satirical is like being you are producing some laugh or humor so producing some causing someone to laugh or smile is a good thing that's why i have put this here in this category now let's discuss some negative tones so the tone and these neutrals are sorry these neutrals not negative but neutral so these neutrals are not basically tones but style of writing so whenever you are talking about some technical subject matter especially you are trying to discuss science and uh, in science you are discussing like neuroscience and most of the people have no idea about the bombardment of neurons and the speed of neurons the number of neurons and uh, how brain functions and what how these neurons impact uh, and how they behave uh, on different kind of occasions in your life and how they give rise to the flow of different kind of hormones and these kind of technicalities cannot be understood by everyone and of course the discussion is very technical so it is not necessary that uh, it is always about science but majorly and mostly it is likely to be about science that you are discussing the functioning of a rocket or you are discussing the formation of a black hole or the formation of a birth of a star and these things are discussed are being discussed with a lot of scientific details of course the discussion is very technical and this style of writing is technical then you could be speculative speculation is simply guess you are never sure about anything and words like maybe perhaps these words will be dominating in this kind of writing that you are not never sure about anything you are just making guesses and uh, it could be like this and it should be like this perhaps this could be better than the current version but you are not very sure this kind of style is speculative you are not taking any side and you are not deciding anything you are not declaring anything you are walking on the line of possibility that this is possible now factual and descriptive and narrative so factual style is like very easy to recognize whenever you come across a factual passage you will be dealing with a lot of data and numbers data in terms of numbers whenever you see uh, 3 million 6 billion or 3086 these kind of numbers have appeared that means you are being very concrete and precise and you are dealing with facts and data and you will not likely to in, you will not be likely to include your own opinion in these kind of passages so when the passage is factual the author will never include his own opinion in any of these discussions the author is not likely to include his opinion in these kind of discussions the author is very likely to include his own opinion and uh, once you understand these tones uh you can answer questions like which of the following the author is likely to agree with so when you understand what was the tone of the author then you will know what kind of this what with what situation the author is more likely to agree then we have this descriptive and narrative 
this is more than tone this is again style of writing so a descriptive style of writing is third person narrative and narrative style of writing is first person na narrative so when you narrate everything by using words like i and we so i when so the author is always present in the situation then the description is na i mean this narration is narrative it is not even description but when the author is not present in the situation he will be describing things like he see it and they then he is descriptive in his writing so more than tone these are styles of writing so these are some important so i have written here some very important tones these are not everything there could be other words also but majorly there are these many tones and as there will not be questions to identify the tone of the author these questions do not appear any more they used to appear in cat paper but not now so you don't need to worry about like how will i answer the question if i get these two choices like angry is also present there and acerbic is also present there then how will you choose Th these kind of situations tend to be very tricky suppose a paper where both these choices are present under the passage for the tone question it could be very tricky situation to mark one of these so but luckily you are not going to face this but still understanding this on this uh, division like positive neutral or negative this is very important so that you can answer questions that which of these the author is likely to agree with now let's jump to uh, some uh, practice questions so we'll be reading some short passages and after reading this short passage you have to decide the tone so almost everyone has gone with b and yes b is the correct answer so you see this kind of description and how did you reach here so you reach to the conclusion that the author is actually being very distant and precise in his description of this stranger so the author is trying to describe a stranger and he says that at sunrise on a first of april there appeared suddenly a man in cream colors at the water side in the city of st louis his cheek was fair now you look how precisely he is describing the complexion of the man complexion and appearance of the man so his cheek was fair his chin downy his hair flaxen his had a white fur one with a long fleecy nap so downy is like very uh, sharp sharp kind of chin and flexion is yellow fleecy is roedar like a very small uh, hair on the surface soft and small hair so he had neither trunk well is carpet bag nor parcel that means he was not carrying anything in his hand 
all these are kinds of bags so he was not carrying any kind of bag in his hand nor a, ni neither a trunk well his carpet bag or parcel nothing no porter followed him and he was not accompanied by any kind of porter he was unaccompanied by friends not even a friend from the shrugged shoulders titters whispers wandering of the crowd it was plain that he was in the extremest sense of the word a stranger so a strange way of describing a stranger he could have simply said that he was a stranger and to the area and to the to everyone now is he mocking anyone certainly he is not mocking and he is not is he incisive yes he is incisive incisive is like very sharp he is very sharp he is very pinpointed so yes he is sharp and pinpointed but he is not mocking anyone and he is certainly not vague this kind of description should not be called vague and there is no element of romance and there is no element of emotion so all these can be eliminated and you are left with b this is the answer now this one again most of you have gone with c and uh, again all of you are correct that uh, he is discussing uh, phenomena by giving certain numbers figures and when you give these kind of numbers and figures you are trying to be factual and precise and he says that scientists still do not fully understand how fireflies fireflies are jugnus are able to produce bioluminescence with upwards of 80 to 90 percent energy efficiency in comparison the average incandescent light bulb and led lights emit only about 10 and 20 percent of their total electrical energy input as light respectively that means incandescent bulb is 10 percent and led is 20 percent but these fireflies use 80 to 90 percent of their energy and the author stone is hopeful and motivated no motivation no hope this is unnecessary he is not enthusiastic or surprised with anything he looks to be informed because he is giving you the exact number and he looks to be precise because of these exact numbers is he disappointed certainly not so easy to eliminate and you only have to understand this do not worry about like getting the right answers here when you are getting the right answer that means you get to under you are understanding the tone of the author
this time again most of you have got it correct and you see what is happening here I, I like this kind of writing look and this kind of humor is called self deprecating humor the tone is humorous and this kind of humor is called self deprecating Some, sometimes you also call it dry humor so as a man grows older it stands to reason that his vulnerability increases three years ago for instance I could be heard in only one way through myself if my best friend's wife had her hair torn off by an electric washing machine I was grieved of course I would make my friend a long speech full of old man's and finish up with a paragraph from Washington's farewell address but when I'd finished but when I'd finished I could go to a good restaurant and enjoy my dinner as usual so after giving him the sermon he would go to the restaurant and he would enjoy his dinner in fact I was pretty much invulnerable when three years ago I put up a conventional veil whenever a ship was sunk or a train got wrecked uh, you, you hear these things in news that a train got wrecked a ship has sunk and he would uh, give a conventional veil like it's, it's, a, it's his moral duty but I don't suppose if the whole city of Chicago had been wiped out I'd have lost a night's sleep over it so even if the whole city of Chicago is wiped out he won't bother much it on the list now if after Chicago it was St. Paul so you get to understand that he must be living in this city so if it is about this city only then he would be bothered about it otherwise he would just give a conventional veil and go to sleep even then I could have moved my luggage over to Minneapolis and rested pretty comfortably all night but that was three years ago not now when I was still a young man I was only 22 now I am vulnerable I am vulnerable in every way I used to have about 10 square feet look at this I used to have about 10 square feet of skin vulnerable to chills and fevers now I have about 20 so what has caused this increase I have not personally enlarged that means his body has not grown like Hulk the 20 feet includes the skin of his family but I might as well have because if a chill or fever strikes any bit of that 20 feet of skin I begin to shiver he is talking about an extended family now he might have got married so and so I ooze gently into the middle age for the true middle age is not the acquirement of years but the acquirement of a family the incomes of childless have wonderful elasticity two people require a room and a bath a couple with child requires the millionaire suit on the sunny side of the hotel and yet I think that marriage is the most satisfactory institution we have I am simply stating my belief that when life has used us for its purposes it takes away all our attractive qualities and gives us instead ponderous but shallow convictions of our own wisdom and experience the older I grow the more I get so I don't know anything if I had been asked to do this article about five years ago it might have been worth reading I mean so he's be trying to be humorous and he is being humorous here again after writing all these things he says that if I had written all these things five years ago it might have been worth reading but now it's not even worth reading so he's simply trying to explain uh, uh, the how peop how people are entangled in responsibilities in their midlife so he is actually discussing or trying to discuss the midlife crisis in that age you get a lot of responsibilities you get extended family there are there is your wife there are children you have a lot of responsibility so you have to worry about them as well but when you are single before that you worry only about yourself and when you have only yourself to worry about you don't worry about anything at all that means you are a free soul you can move around freely and happily so this comparison has been made and the tone in which he has written this is humorous he is trying to 
produce some kind of smile on the face of his reader. He is not being sarcastic because he is not attacking anyone. Despairing is hopeless, so hopelessness is not being highlighted here because he has also called the marriage to be the most satisfactory institution here. Some of you might want to take it as hopelessness, but no, it is not hopelessness and he is not being argumented. So, A is the answer. Sarcasm is like uh, you look at your friend's shoes and you notice that the shoes are very muddy, they are not very good and they, they, they look very ugly and still you look at them and you say, wow, what a beautiful shoes. So, in this kind of comment is sarcasm. When you mean something else, but you say something else, this is sarcasm. in sarcasm you are attacking someone some someone else he 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 was being self deprecating So, almost everyone has missed this question and I kind of understand the reason that you could not get it correct. So, you could not get it correct because you do not understand these terms, you do not understand naturist and you do not know what a natural historian is. So, I think had you known these two words, it would have been easy for you to guess the answer. So, let us discuss these words. And the before that, let us see what has been discussed in the passage. So, the process of pollination in flowers has been discussed and how these insects such as thubs, they are helpful in pollinating these flowers. This is what the author is trying to describe here and uh, some of these plants flowers are self fertilized and some are crossed over. So, when they are crossed over, 
they are like it has been done by thubs, but even when thubs do this sometimes it could be from the same plant. So, when it is from the same plant it is still not a very good example of crossover it is like self fertile process almost equal to the process of self fertilization. So, the process of fertilization in flowers the pollination in flowers is has been discussed here and the point of view from which the passage is told can be best described as that of a bored naturist. So, first of all when the author has been so detailed you should not call him bored. So, calling him bored is not a good idea plus who is a naturist. So, naturist is basically nudist. These people love to be so close to the nature that they do not even like to wear clothes. So, they love nature of course, they love nature and they love nature to the extent that they do not like wearing clothes. They like be close to the nature as much as possible and for that I would not even need to wear any clothes. So, I am a nudist, I am a naturist and uh, B calls him frugal. So, horticulturist could have been ok. You can call this kind of author to be a horticulturist, but why are you calling him a frugal horticulturist? Who is frugal? So, frugal is a person who is like who does not want to spend much money that kind of person is called frugal miserly person is called frugal. Now, here there is no reason to call him frugal either you take the sense of money or you take the sense of using words. So, the author has used lot of words to describe whatever he is trying to describe. So, even in that sense it does not make any sense to call him frugal. So, calling frugal to this kind of author is not a good idea. Despondent is like disappointed, unhappy, sad, theologian. So, first of all he is not despondent plus he is not discussing religion or God. So, if he is not discussing religion or God do not call him theologian, he is not discussing theology. Now, exhaustive why exhaustive can be used for this kind of author because of the way he has described this process he is being very detailed. So, here this exhaustive stands for detailed. Now, who is a natural historian? A natural historian is no one but naturalist. So, a person who studies natural phenomena uh, especially the lives of animal, plant and uh, uh, like fungus, bacteria these things. He studies these things in detail and with a like uh, his attitude is going to be more of an observational than uh, conducting experiments. So, he would not be these natural historians would not be conducting too many ex too many experiments rather they will be observing the natural phenomena and trying to dis distinguish the patterns the behavior it is easy. These kind of people are called natural historian or naturalist. So, this is naturalist this is naturist. So, some of you have got confused with this word naturist that is why you went with A, but A is not the answer answer is D. The author is can be considered to be an exhaustive natural historian. Now, this one yeah naturist is different naturalist is different. Naturist is nudist because he does not like to wear clothes, but naturalist is someone who studies nature and uh, especially the animals, uh, the plants or any kind of flora or fauna is being studied. He studies their behavioral pattern by observing their behavior.
So again a lot of you have uh, gone with uh, A and A is the correct answer. Let us see what has been discussed and then we will discuss these words. So in society says Mr. Mahfi, every civilized man and woman ought to feel it their duty to say something even when there is hardly anything to be said and in order to encourage this delightful art of brilliant chatter he has published a social guide without which no David Ante or Dandy should ever dream of going out to dine. Not that Mr. Mahfi's book can be said to be in any sense of the word popular in discussing this important subject of conversation, he has not merely followed the scientific method of Aristotle which is perhaps excusable, but he has adopted the literary style of Aristotle for which no excuse is possible. There is also hardly a single anecdote, hardly a single illustration and the reader is left to put the professor's abstract rules into practice without either the examples or the warning of history to encourage or to dissuade him in his reckless career. Still, the book can be warmly recommended to all who propose to substi substitute the vice of verbosity for the stupidity of silence. It fascinates in spite of its form and pleases in spite of its pedantry, pedantry and is the nearest approach that we know that we know of in modern literature to meeting Aristotle at an afternoon tea. Now, what do you think the author is, author's attitude towards Mahfi's book? So, Mr. Mahfi has written a book and what is the author's attitude towards that book? Is it adulatory or derogatory? It is derogatory. And uh, it is it's a perfect example of sarcasm actually. And uh, in the options you do not find sarcasm, but you find this sardonic. So, this sardonic tone is nothing but sarcasm. So, it is sarcasm at its best and uh, every sentence is sarcastic, every sentence of this writing piece of writing is sarcastic. So, every civil, first you call him civilized man and then you say ought to feel it their duty to say something even when they have got nothing to say and in order to encourage this delightful art of brilliant chatter, delightful art of chatter, again sarcasm, he has published a social guide without which no debutante or dandy should ever like, it is like no girl or boy, especially young girl and young boy should ever dream of going out to dine not that Mr. Mavis book can be said to be popular in any sense of word, it cannot be said to be popular and it is ok that he has tried to adopt literally style of Aristotle for that he can be forgiven, but now uh, he cannot be forgiven uh, for trying to copy his style like uh, um, for which there is no excuse. And if you, if he had only tried to follow the scientific method of a total, then perhaps it is excusable. So, you see that this is very sarcastic and that is why it is called sardonic, this choice is given instead of sarcasm here. And uh, if you have read the white tiger which I mentioned earlier, the voice of the author, voice of Arvindadiga has been sardonic throughout the novel. Now, what is contemplative? Contemplative is lost in thought. So, if you are lost in thought, you are contemplative, you are thinking about something and you are lost in your thought. Histrionic is excessively dramatic. And laconic is saying little meaning more. Kam sabdo mein bahut kuch keh jana, kam sabdo mein bahut zyada baate keh jana. Is style ko, is wit ko aap bolte hain laconic wit. 
सो ये वर्बोज का उल्टा है लेकोनिक यूजिंग वेरी लिटिल वर्ड्स एंड सेंग ए लॉट सो संस्कृत इज द मोस्ट लेकोनिक लैंग्वेज Now let's do this one. Yeah, melodramatic or excessively dramatic. no freud doesn't write like this it was not written by freud and uh, replacing the vice of verbosity by stupidity of silence is like uh, trying to say that neither of the condition is very pleasant so if everyone is silent because they have got nothing to say the situation would look very awkward and like uh, suppose five people five individuals go out for a dinner and no one speaks anything everyone is silent the situation would look very awkward and everything everyone would look stupid but when you have got nothing meaningful to say should you talk for the sake of talking like people do this a lot so because they are trying to avoid the stupidity of silence and that's why they will feel it with the vice of verbosity so the other uh, might have been trying to say that we need to find a middle ground for everything and even when we don't have anything to say a small chit chat would do it's okay but being verbose is not a good idea now for this question so it, it's it could be a long read as compared to the other questions but here the question is saying that the the author has written in this passage in order to which one of these to respond to a specific critic who has cast doubt on his works real uh, reliability or is he trying to propose a psychological experiment or is he trying to discuss common causes of nightmares or he is trying to justify his work and address some of his its limitations so d is the answer because when you have read this entire passage the two paragraphs you will not find any mention of a specific critic he is not answering to any specific critic so he has conducted some experiment on i think a dream and uh, there were some flaws in his uh, 
work. So, he is trying to justify uh, his work and address some of the limitations of his work. So, in attempting to discuss the interpretation of dreams, I do not believe that I have overstepped. So, when I say that I do not believe that I have overstepped the bounds of neuropathological interest, this itself, this first sentence itself is explanatory like he is trying to give justification that no, do not say this, I have not overstepped anything. For when investigated psychologically, the dream proves to be the first thing in a chain of abnormal psychic uh, structures whose other links, the hysterical phobia, the obsession and the delusion must interest the physician for practical reasons. The dream can lay no claim to a corresponding practical significance. So, in this first part basically he is explaining his work and uh, here in this part peculiarities in the material I have used to elucidate the interpretation of dreams have rendered this publication difficult. The work itself will demonstrate why all dreams related in scientific literature or collected by others had to remain useless for me, my purposes. In choosing my examples I had to limit myself look at this. So, here he is discussing the limitations. I had to limit myself to considering my own dreams and those of my patients who were under psychoanalytic treatment. I was restrained from utilizing material derived from my patients dreams by the fact that during their treatment the dream processes were subjected to an undesirable complication the intermixture of neurotic characters. characters. So, I will not read it like in detail from the underlined part you can understand that here he is giving an explanation and here he is discussing the limitation of his work. So, obvious answer is D. Now, let us do this one. When, when the options are from the same category like they are all positive or they are all negative in that case it could be a bit tricky uh, like here most of you have got it incorrect C is not the correct answer and it is ok the confusion is obvious. So, most of you have gone with the C and which is quite understandable you are not at you are not at fault in doing this but do you understand this word reverential do you understand the idea of this word to revere someone so to revere is like 
to praise someone or something excessively, to give a lot of respect, to, to show appreciation to the limit of admiration. And like, like uh, to worship to the limit of worshipping someone. So, it, it, the author here is being reverential for the dog and he is saying the best friend a man has in this world may turn. So, even your best friend may turn against you and become your enemy, your son, your daughter whom you have reared with loving care may prove ungrateful to you and those who are nearest and dearest to you might one day kill you and uh, may become traitors of their faith. The money that you possess will be gone one day and it flies from you perhaps when you need it the most, your money and a man's reputation, so even your reputation that you have garnered by your hard work may be sacrificed in a moment of ill considered action, you will lose your reputation in a zippy. The people who are prone to fall on their knees to do us honor when success is with us may be the first to throw the stone of malice when failure settles its cloud upon your head. The one absolutely unselfish friend that a man can have in this selfish world, the one that never deserts him, your friend that will never desert you and the one that never proves ungrateful or treacherous to you is your dog. So, this is for dog lovers actually. So, those who love dogs would love this kind of writing. And here, like he is trying to say that your dog is everything and you should respect your dog more than your parents, more than your wife, more than your spouse, more than your sons and daughters, more than your friends, more than your money, more than your reputation, more than your job, more than your life. You should respect your dog because dog is the one that will never leave you. Now, what are you being towards dog? Are you being laudatory? Of course, you are being laudatory, but you have crossed certain limits. You have crossed the limit of being laudatory. Laudatory is like praising the dogs and, but look at this. Uh, after reading this writing, I said it, the situation becomes tricky when all the choices are from the same category. So, all four choices seem to be correct and that is why it is tricky. Now, to this kind of writing where the author has crossed every limit and to praise his dog. Now, this is not a normal kind of praise like dogs are very loyal and uh, very friendly and one should be grateful to their dogs and because, grot, because dogs are never ungrateful or treacherous. So, that would have been a normal kind of praise, but here you, you see what, what is happening you have to leave everyone aside, every kind of relationship has been compared with the dog. This is like crossing the boundary of uh, adulation. So, you have crossed the normal boundaries of adulation and that is why it has become reverential. You uh, revere the dogs. Are you being empathetic? No, empathetic it has got nothing to do with this kind of writing and unconditionally affectionate. So, affection is like love and uh, here you will show your love to your dog that I love my dog a lot and I can do anything for my dog. This kind of writing could have been unconditional affection, but here because you have crossed every limit, every boundary of normal appreciation, it has fallen into the category of worshipping your dog. So, that is why A is the best choice out of the given alternative. 
had it not been there if this word is not there and then you want to go with C definitely you can go with C had this not been there and you want to go with D definitely you can go with D but as long as this reverential is present this is the best choice. So what is happening here? Let us see. Uh, reminiscence I think here the author is trying to uh, remember some episodes from the past or some time from the past. In between school days we gathered hazelnuts finished uh, sorry fished we gathered hazelnuts fished had long deer hunting weekends went to powwows baited on looms and made quilts. I did not question the necessity or value of our school education, but somehow I grew up knowing it. It was not the only education I would need. I am thankful. I am thankful for those experiences of my uh, Anishinaabe heritage, because now I know by heart not only the national anthem, but the ancient song of the loon. I recognize not only the alphabet and the parts of an English sentence, but the intricate language of a beaver's teeth and tail. Beaver is like uh, an animal which lives near uh, wet places, ponds especially. In Hindi you call it like uh, Udbilao. So the author's overall tone in this passage is best described as which one? So as jubilation, jubilation is like extreme happiness. It is a positive word and the tone is also positive, but is it that positive that you call it like extreme jubilation like wow I got the chance to bunk my school almost each and every day and I was happy not to be at the school among the boring teachers, but out there with my beautiful and interesting friends. So, had it been something like this then we could have called it jubilation but it is simply appreciation for the chance that the author got and uh, it is trying to say that not only he got the chance to learn from the books, but also he got the chance to read and study the nature and learn from it. And he got these chances because he went to the school where he was allowed very frequently to go out and visit places with his friends. So, awe is also a positive term and in awe you also like show surprise and respect, but here that element is not dominant. Curiosity, he could have been curious in his childhood, but in this writing there is no curiosity. 
so don't go with this suddenly it is the appreciation and appreciation for the chance that he got in his life and uh, for the schooling system and for the uh, experiences of Anishina Bay heritage so like he got these chances to go out and learn from the nature and he is appreciating these things there is no element of uncertainty so don't need to go with E so and I am thankful it is like ex being gratitude expressing your gratitude and appreciating whatever you have in life so these were the examples that I brought for today and the uh, figures of speech was the session that you have already done today we discussed some of the tones and tried to understand different kind of uh, writing styles so you will be dealing with passages of every kind of seriousness or every kind of humor and you need to understand the tone of the passages uh, this understanding can help you in answering questions uh, of main idea supporting idea and also the question where it is asked that which of these with the author will the author agree or won't agree so once you understand the tone of the author once you understand what the author is trying to say here then it is easy to pick the choice with which the author is likely to agree so uh, that was tones for you uh, tomorrow your uh, regular sessions of this crash course starts and probably it is going to be geometry by abstraction so best of luck for that and uh, happy learning happy reading yeah the, the these pdfs have uh, previously been shared in the whatsapp group that you have joined and i'll make sure that uh, this pdf is shared again in the whatsapp group Okay, thank you. Good night, everyone. Yeah, WhatsApp group is for paid students and uh, you will be added to those groups once you uh, enroll in one of these batches and uh, this is the final batch which is crash course so this is last chance for those of you who have not joined yet <laughs>